What's up? Welcome back to Where Are All My Friends. This one is so special to me because I get to talk to one of my longtime friends, Matthew Morgan. We have known each other probably since 2010, 10 years plus, and he has a crazy come up story. We get into it right away, so I don't want to say too much, but basically went from playing in bands to becoming a very successful composer and songwriter. And it was a really fun one because it was the perfect balance of an amazing come up story mixed with some really incredible life lessons and inspiration in the least cheesy way possible. It just turned into a really good discussion and some really valuable things that he learned along his journey. Really, really fun episode. One of my favorites. I hope you like it. Let's get straight into it. All right. Where are all my friends sitting here? across the country from you right now, as we're all staying home, but with my dear, dear friend, Matthew Morgan. And as much as I like to do these interviews in person, being able to now do some over the internet has opened it up where I can talk to friends like you from across the country. And boy, am I excited for this one. Dude, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, dude, thank you. I... <laughs> I'm just excited because you and I, like, I love having people on that I've, like, kind of just met and hearing some newer stories, but we have so many layers to our story of friendship, and I respect what you do. Ugh. And I respect what you do so much in your career, so, like, the chance to do this right now is just, it's going to be fun. I'm excited. Dude, I can't wait. I'm so excited. Yes. All right. And I think we have a pretty cool little setup here. We got our logic dialed in. We're talking yeah. on FaceTime. Absolutely. I'm, I'm feeling good. Feels so 2020. I know, right? Good. I'm making it work. Okay, so check me out. I normally uh, intro these a little bit differently, but because of our friendship, there's a note that I wrote oh, on a God. flight out okay. to see you for your wedding. Jeez. And Dude. I just feel like it sets That's the scene. That's some real friend level stuff right there. <laughs> right? But I like, I want this to be as real as possible. And like, this is, how could this be any more real than the note that I wrote? Like, That's I had true. no idea that I would be reading this right And now, I can't but... believe you do this for all of your podcast guests. Every person that comes on, you read a note that you wrote <laughs> when you're flying to visit them for their wedding. That's, dude, that's really cool of you, honestly. The thing is, weddings get expensive and I don't know how many more podcasts I'm going to be able to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. All right, are you ready? Yeah, I'm excited. To hear I'm it. so excited to read this to you in real time right now. Okay, you ready? Yeah. I already asked you that. I'm sitting here on this flight thinking of this journey out to see you too. I remember when we both wrote on a small piece of paper, Matt wrote, where are we now? And I wrote, one day, man. We dated those little pieces of paper. That was April 18th, 2012. Oh my and God. how insane is that to think that five years later we're here? So damn, that was three years ago. Yeah. You did it, Matt. From driving across the country in vans, watching movies in Bench One, trips to Japan, and everything in between, you turned the page onto a huge new chapter of your life, and that all happened in five years. I remember catching up with you on the phone, you telling me that this would be the girl you would marry. Well, shit, cuz, I guess you were right about that one. <laughs> We've moved on from touring and stayed friends, and look what, um, and look where that brought us. Truly Man. insane. Very proud of you both, dude. You're gonna like have me crying at the beginning of the at the top of the hour. Jeez, bruh. That is so sweet. So, it also sounds like the like best AOL buddy profile that there could ever be. Like you know, you'd put all your like closest friends in your profile and all your <laughs> memories. That was like the ultimate one of those. <laughs> that I was like incredible. That. Dude, th that is so sweet. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. What's funny is that was three years ago, all of that. Right. Uh, and like, the reason that I thought that that would be so perfect to read right now is that kind of tells the story too of like, that's what I want to talk about. Yeah. You definitely. toured in bands. You made a huge pivot. You found extreme success, not only in your career, but you married the girl of your dreams you are living where you want to live. Like Man, Hannah is going to love this episode. Jeez. Let's go, <laughs> Hannah. <laughs> 
But yeah, like it's that's the story I want to tell. And it's so cool to be able to talk about this with a friend now after having so much history. And I really respect what you've done in your career. Dude, thank you so and much. And it fits this podcast so well. Man. So having read that note, I guess take me back. What like, what a high bar you've set that now I feel like everything I say has to be as beautiful, as well put. You've really backed me into a corner here. I really have. And I expect the best from you. Mm. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So I think the spot that I want to start is tell me a little bit about your touring days. Like that's such a huge yeah. part of your life. Tell me about those days. Tell me about that pivot. And like, just tell that story of like, explain the context to what that note is, you know? Yeah. Okay. So um, I, I'm going to go to the very beginning really quickly, but then I'll get us to... Um, today hopefully even faster um, <laughs> okay cool. I, I met my best friend Jose in seventh grade um, we started a band together in eighth grade called divided by Friday um, we wrote music and recorded music all through high school and then when we got to college we signed a record deal started touring um, met you in 2010 2011 I think on so the, on the road and you and I uh, were both in bands that were at the same level and trying to get to that next level together. And we did three, four tours. We toured the world like literally <laughs> yeah. together. Um, and Which had, is kind of rare, right? Like yeah, bands absolutely. don't always tour that much together. And don't always get along so well as our two bands did. Um, yeah. Like just to epic epic proportions uh like we i don't even know where to start because we have so many stories and have slept in so many dingy garages together have so many band collab songs oh my gosh music videos <laughs> oh my god you filmed the northwood plaza video you filmed our hip hop side project um <laughs> after playing a show to probably 12 people maybe that, 12 we, but, but maybe that's I think that's part of what makes our bond so strong, though, is like we have so many shared memories of like times that should have been the worst and most depressing of times actually being like some of the <laughs> most fun times of our lives. And like it's that grind that we put in together and experience together that I think like is what sealed our bond so well. Like, oh, dude, absolutely. There's no way those times should have been miserable. Like, it yeah. was, and such they were a at grind. times. They, they, they were, but, but we had so much fun with it. Like, we made fun of that, the, yeah. like the grind, and just exactly. were passionately excited. To, like, we to all just had our eyes. Yeah, exactly. We we all had our eyes on the prize, and we were going to do whatever we could to get there and to get there together. <laughs> Yeah, which was so sick. But no, so keep telling me though that. So you, in college, signed. We started touring a bit together, but obviously you did other tours and the band did other things. Yeah, so um, after, right, and we toured for four or five years full-time um, after we signed our deal. And then um, eventually our kind of taste started changing, our um, professional goals started changing and what we wanted to do and um, Jose and I decided we're gonna stop playing pop rock and punk music and we decided we wanted to move to LA and try and write pop music full time um, and so we did that <laughs> and then we kind of fell backwards into writing music for movie trailers and that became writing music for TV shows and advertisements and video game ads um, and then we kind of were like, this is a cool little spot to be in. We're going to chill here. And we've been chilling here for about five years now. <laughs> <laughs> you found a good spot to chill. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. We like landed on a branch and we're like, yeah, this one works perfectly for us. We're going to chill. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. I think that you said that really well and we said it pretty quickly, but. Yeah, that, I, I'm trying to fly through that as quickly as I can. Yeah. And you know, it's funny, like. We could talk, uh, like, we could get into, like, the days of touring and all that, but I don't feel like that's really where your story starts, right? Like, you know, in a sense, yes, it was a yeah. huge part of your life. Like, from seventh grade, you said? Eighth grade, seventh grade? Yeah, yeah. 
you were doing that band up until you were how old? 23. Yeah. So, for, so, like that's, so 10 years. Yeah. That's a lot of time. <laughs> um, and I think like you guys, it's funny, like you say it so humbly, right? And we were grinding it out in the day. Oh my gosh, dude. In our day. But you you did hit some strides of success, like in that lane. Yeah. You guys, like we got to go to Japan together. We got to like yeah. both bands, like your band, Divided by Friday, toured pretty much the world. Yeah, we I mean, we did Japan with you guys. We did um, Europe, all of Europe, mm-hmm. basically with Mayday Braid and mm-hmm. the US, however many times. But dude, I, yep. yeah, but that I... We're skating past it. It was definitely like the dream at at the time. Like we achieved all of the things we wanted to achieve, basically with yeah. that band. Um, and that that I think that's kind of also why it felt like a good time for us. Like we decided in the band shortly after, maybe like a month or so after we got back from Europe. And like I had written down years before on like my life bucket list of like i just want to play a show in italy like my family's from italy like that that was just like a big thing for me and then we played two shows in italy and it was like yo i i'm good there you get it yeah well and that that exact spot is what's so interesting to me because it can be really hard like that becomes your identity you're doing something for 10 years and like you're young right like that's a huge part of your life and to then be like yo I'm going to change this and I'm going to, I'm going to stop doing the one thing that I know so well. Granted, you still did music, yeah, but yeah. like that can be a really scary pivot. And and I remember those times, right? Like we've yeah. been friends through all that. And I think a lot of bands, a lot of artists would lean into staying comfortable and yeah. I don't want to say lying to themselves, but like not confronting the brutal facts of being like, yo, where do I really want to be? What are my next set of goals? And yeah, does what is what the I'm doing shelf right life now? on this? Like, how long can we do this? And honestly, like we had, or I, I'm not going to speak for Jose, but like I personally had, I don't want to say a struggle, but like, yeah, it was a struggle actually. Like trying to figure out once we ended that, like, like you said, my identity was so wrapped up in that. And like, I lived that band for so long. It's like, who am I? If I'm not Matt from Divided by Friday, who yeah. am I? And that and that was like, dude, that 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 took me a, a, a bit to figure out. Like that, there's a lot of just confronting myself and be like, who are you? But also like, who do you want to be? Yeah, and that kind of is like what I feel like landing on that is what helped me kind of turn that page of like, okay, I can decide who I am because I know I am no, I am not Matt from Divided by Friday, quote unquote. Yeah. And that's a really scary, hard thing to do. I think that that, again, I can't speak for everybody, but I think that that comes up in life a lot where it's like, where do you draw that line of like, are you a quitter or are you brutally honest and aware of times to make pivots? Yeah, And, And that to me, like, I really love that part of the story. So the band had its level of success. You guys were getting into a different interest in music though right like you were starting to get really into pop music Mm -hmm. and you were on an indie label that like you know like are you really yeah like are you gonna get is a punk rock label gonna get a pop song on top 40 like yeah you're setting that's an unrealistic expectation yeah so not only that but you're in la right i don't want to tell your story too much but you're in la and wasn't your first movie trailer tv like on that side, almost an accident. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like not, it what wasn't happened? almost an accident. It, it was one hundred percent. What is happening? Um, we had. I mean, when we were living in LA, we were doing songwriting sessions every day, and someone would have like a brief from a record label of like, okay, Ariana Grande is looking for a song that sounds like this. Justin Bieber is looking for that. I mean, they all are wanting just the next smash hit single and they're wanting it in their inbox by friday and they want it to sound like a b and c and go um on this particular day our friend uh patrick ridgen came in uh he had been playing bass for divided by friday um i think for that last year in our live shows but he had a brief for a tv ad it sounded like goes for game of thrones and they were just looking for a dark cover of a classic song and this is middle of 2014 so like that whole trend of movie trailers having dark covers and then 
was just starting to hit. Um, so we did a cover of What a Wonderful World, and I had kind of had this like backseat interest of writing trailer music and orchestral music for a few years. Um, I had some samples on my computer, like just hard drives that I could just for fun um, between tours kind of orchestrate some stuff or just write stuff that was just totally not at all for release. Um, mm-hmm. And so I had those samples. We did this cover and our manager at the time was like, hey, I'm going to send this to this company, Position Music. They are the top company I know of that does music for movie trailers and for TV shows and advertisements. And he sent it to them and they loved it. And like within a month or something, it was in this huge video game ad for EA games. And then I think a month or two later, it was like the big trailer for Insurgent, which was the Divergent series, I think is what it's called. Um, And that was like suddenly we went from not making a dime of money from music to we were able to like live for a year off of the checks we were getting. It was like, oh, this is incredible. Like I, I, how did we not know this existed? It felt like a little secret that we had stumbled upon and we're like, I hope nobody else finds out (laughs) that you can make money from music. Yeah, like I'm trying to remember, I think you and I, because you, I was living in Florida and you would come visit your family for the holidays down there. Yeah. And I feel like we were hanging out. I we're at a Best say, Buy. Yeah, dude. I rem- <laughs> We're walking through a Best Buy and you're explaining this to me. And you're yeah. like, yeah, dude, like we got like a check. And yeah. I'm like, you're like, dude, like we're going to like, we got enough to like live. And yeah. I was like off off one thing like <laughs> yeah. both of us Dude, right like yeah we it was were, like what is happening this, this yeah is like not, it was like this, you found it was totally not the world that you and i were used to experiencing in music it was like no. we, we were used to just the grind of it and like oh my I mean, to have a budget for a music video was a big deal and yeah that, that's not even going in your pocket this, this the is idea, actually money we're getting to eat with yeah the idea of like a royalties coming in from like a mad like getting paid off of the actual music like sure yeah. you can find a way to sell your merch you can make money on tour but you were like yeah our song got yeah. us paid and i was like i'm sorry what, what? <laughs> you mean so, your t-shirt sales <laughs> yeah 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 your your, your touring merch. t-shirt sales is what but that blew that for sure blew my mind and that to me at least from my side felt like this moment of like oh things just changed yeah. And it felt like that. I mean, once we did that and obviously saw some success with it, they asked us to do like a whole EP of similar dark songs. And then like from then on, we were just making money in sync. And that was in sync. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> within the sync side of music, it was the first like we didn't know that existed. We had no idea for the 10 years we did our band that because we we had... Divided by Friday, we had music on ESPN, but it was for free. They, it was <laughs> a, it wasn't a, we will give you money for this. No. It was, we will play your music on TV and we will give you nothing for it. And we're like, yeah, and you're our, stoked. Our, you're our like, music this is on our ESPN. shot. Oh my yeah. God, we made it. Yeah, this is going to change everything for us. Every person watching yeah, this football exactly. game is going to come to our show now. Exactly. And that happened. I can't believe it. <laughs> Plot twist. No, so that, yeah, like, that that was really crazy. And at that time, did you, like, was it pretty clear, like, you're like, okay, cool, this is what we're doing? Like, no yeah, question. Yeah, oh, for or, sure. Because, yeah. like, I mean, like I said, I Jose and I had had discussions before of, like, grand scheme, our career, our plan was, we're going to, Divided by Friday is going to get so massive <laughs> and just be the biggest band in the world that, people will be knocking on our doors, begging us practically to write film scores for them because everyone knows the parallels between writing punk rock music and doing film scores. I mean, countless. Music 101. It's a no brand. It's page one, you write punk music, turn the page, you're now scoring films. So, Sometimes, like, looking back at those, I'm, like, mad at myself. I'm like, how, <laughs> in what world did I think that that would work? Yeah, I, we're so sure. It's like, clearly the band is going to get, I mean, obviously the band is going to get massive to the point that we, we, the world is at our fingertips. We can do anything we want. And, but 
at the top of that list was we wanted to write orchestral music and do yeah. film scores. And so as soon as we started getting music synced to picture and mm -hmm. making money from it, we we're like, oh, we're just skipping like <laughs> 20 years into the future here. Let's just do this now because yeah. like I think Jose with his first check bought his engagement ring and got engaged to his now Damn, wife. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. So I mean, the, there were like all of these things were just falling into place. And we're like, oh, th this is like, it felt like that's where we were like supposed to be at that time. And it was just finally all falling into place. It was just like listening to the universe. Like, here's the writing on the wall. Yeah. Here it is. Like, just be honest and follow these signs. Double down. And, and what's funny is like, it felt in a lot of ways, like we had been spending the 10 years prior, like preparing for that because like we were, especially, I mean, now I feel that way every day. We, we were, when we weren't writing pop rock music, we were trying to write metal or like producing just for fun, like for some of our friends, just some hip hop tracks, like, and we'd been doing that just for fun. And then to this day, like now we're actually, I just created artwork for a production album called modern hip hop. Like we're doing all these different genres and it's yeah. like we had been trained for it and didn't realize it. It's almost like the the early band days. I mean, we always talked, even in the moment, it was like, this is like, this is our version of college. Like yeah, it's a exactly. grind, but you learn how to work so hard and you learn all these fundamental skills. And if you can execute them with zero resource, when yeah. you're put in a position where you have resource, you're just like, oh, this is easy mode. Let's go. Yeah. I mean, it always felt like, I mean, not felt like we were getting such an education, like on being entrepreneurs and on like networking and marketing, just in real time, we were learning all of this. And I remember someone, we were in a studio one time and there was an intern there. Um, what's that called? Belmont? Is that the one? And mm, what, I know that that is a college. It's it, also but, a pop punk band that I like a lot. Oh, maybe they were from Full Sail. Anyways, there was like an intern in the studio and they're like, what's the best advice you could give me? And someone was like, you're in the music industry, drop out of college and start working in the music industry. And I'm not saying that's like a blanket statement to make. Yeah. But th th that is like, when I heard that, I was like, I, I back that idea. Like I know. It's, <laughs> it's hard for me, right? Like anytime somebody asks you, like anybody in that like young adult, maybe yeah. college, maybe touring thing, it's really hard because... I don't think that college is the right path for music. Yeah. However, I have met people that have done that path and they have skills and knowledge in certain areas that I yeah. don't. There's but definitely I'm not saying there for are sure, but, there are success stories on both sides. And yeah. I hate saying on both sides because I mean, really, it it I dropped out of college. Mm -hmm. Did you go to college? Like I went for two semesters. I went for two semesters also. Ty. <laughs> so <laughs> I think our allegiances are stated. Yep. But uh, yeah. So actually, you know what? You said something to me. I I'm in a tiny sidebar here, though, because just on the subject of education, I remember very recently we were talking and you were saying something about imposter syndrome. And oh, God. You're really calling me out. Yeah. I Well, it's I, I, because I, now I suffer... here you are re-educating yourself. Yeah. So like, I, I feel like I suffer from imposter syndrome worse than anyone has ever suffered from it. Um, it Every day I feel like I have faked it till I made it and now I have to show up. So like you and I were talking a few weeks ago about this and I told you like one way I've decided to combat that is I've at the university in our town, I've started taking like music theory classes and trying to actually educate myself so I don't feel like such a fraud and so that I actually do know what I'm talking about and I can talk about all different like modes of music and like yeah, voice I leading and all. Yeah, I mean, it's... Well, I think, I think that go. there's a level of anxiety or like if you're not prepared for something or you don't feel like you're educated on it, you can always feel that uh, imposter syndrome or anxiety. Yeah. And I loved, like, you kind of blew my mind when you said that. Because I think we all feel that, whatever it is, our lane, our professional capacity. And when you said that to me, I was just like, damn, like, it doesn't have to always feel like that. You can yeah. study whatever it is. Find that thing. Be brutally honest with where you're like, yo, I'm not good enough here. I could know more here. And then study it. 
So that's the only reason I wanted to bring that up is like we yeah. talk about this with college and I don't think college is the best in most lanes with music, but yeah. I think education is fucking tight. Yeah. I mean, it, I definitely, that, it, it depends on what you want to do in music too. I mean, I will say like in when I sat down in August in my music theory class, I was like, oh, this is the first time in my life I've ever had formal music education. And all these kids around me have like grown up with it and they knew so much more. They knew all of their scales backwards and forwards and their key signatures. And I was like, oh my God, there's all this stuff that like I should know. And I did have like a kind of basic idea. Um, but I mean, there, there there is something to having a formal education for it. Just like, I think if you're wanting to be like a tour manager or like a tour, like a photographer or something, like, I don't necessarily think you need to go to school for four years to learn that right. when you exactly. can just be you're gonna, grinding out on the road. Yeah, go intern at a venue, go shadow somebody. Like, exactly. Kind Find of someone on it. Twitter that can offer you advice. Yeah. Well, anyway, I, I don't want to derail too much. We were talking about how the early days of independent music in the band days was the college of life that led you up to this. Yeah. Um, and then another thing that I was thinking about was fill this timeline in for me because there started to be some success. You got those checks. Jose got the engagement ring. I didn't know that. I love that. But like yeah. enough where you're like, oh, like life could change here. Yeah. You double down on that. Another thing that I know was huge for you, which was like a life milestone. And I don't know how long it took. Didn't you get to go overseas and record like live strings at the yeah. craziest studio possible? Yeah. So I on our first meeting with position actually um they were telling us the kind of like laying out the groundwork of what their company does and the composers they work with and there's some pretty big names and they were saying you know we're look, we're recording a bunch of our trailer albums which is an album of songs for movie trailers mm -hmm. um we've been recording them all at air studios recently and like for me i feel like I, a lot of people watch like the dark Knight or like they hear Hans Zimmer and they're like, that's my, like, can I, I know film music? I know Hans Zimmer or John Williams. Those are like the two people, people know. And yeah. so like, for me, I knew of air studios because Hans Zimmer, obviously the biggest name probably right now in film music, totally. he does all of his album or all of his soundtracks there. Um, he did inception there, which for me is like the movie that I was like, I have to write orchestral music that full stop that this that's it for me dog um, even before orchestral music you wrote a dbf song about inception that that is also true yeah i mean <laughs> it, it is too it is my favorite movie of all time um very good and so like i knew that they recorded inception there i knew like they recorded the first harry potter soundtrack part of it there uh and so like as soon as they said that i was like oh my god we, we have to do that like all the way I'm all in with this company just if we can do that and so like we were working with them and a few years later we had kind of been writing an album over time uh, and then they let us know that they did want to do it live and I remember that just the fact that they wanted to record it live like we were just so excited about that because I it, it was we had samples and stuff but there's a huge difference between a uh, violin section sample for my keyboard versus like hearing a full string section playing your parts and so to get to do that for th for the first time and learning we were gonna do that was a big deal and then a few weeks later we found out that the intention was definitely that we were going to do it at air um so like a month before we got or i got married um april it was actually it was it, it was three years ago today um nice really yeah, it was, I, Jose showed me yesterday. Um, we we did it April first and April second of twenty seventeen. Um, Holy! Yeah, so we did eleven songs with sixty players, um, and it was like the yeah easily the best in the musical slash professional career I've had. It was definitely like the standout moment of like oh wow that like it felt like everything I'd ever done led up to that moment. Um, and everything I've done since is in an effort to return <laughs> to that room. <laughs> well, like, I don't know. That's just crazy. It's more, I'm obsessed with that, right? Like you found the thing and then it just kept giving you signs of like, keep going and yeah, keep definitely. going in this, keep going. And, uh, 
from there, so you said that was, tell me that time again. April 2017. Yeah, so that's still, we have three more years of continued success. So I guess pick up from there. So after we finished that album, like a few months later, there was a big trailer for A Wrinkle in Time, which was a Disney movie coming out. They used one of our tracks from that album uh, called Challenger One. And that felt like kind of the validation I'd been wanting and like didn't know that I had been wanting. Like that, that was the first time I was like, oh, okay. So I, up to that point, we like most of our success had just been doing covers. And so I always felt like, like, yeah, we're successful at this, but it's just doing covers. So like how legitimate, it's not anything that like we've come up with. And so then when that happened, I was like, oh, wow. Like this actually, I, I felt less of that imposter syndrome that we were talking about. Like it, it felt, Validating. Yeah, that's a massively validating thing. Yeah, and th- th- that was for sure like part of one of those signs you're talking about of like keep going, keep going. Like I have this just inherent self doubt at all times that I'm always like, are I ask Jose every day like, are we even good at this? Like, is is this good? Is this bad? I don't know. Like, I just know it's coming out of my head, putting it on the computer, and someone else can. It, it's not for me to say if it's good or bad. It's for the world to let us know if it is. And that felt like a big like, all right. You guys don't suck at this. So um, I love that you just shared that too. Because from afar to me, I'm like, you're the best at this. And oh, it's crazy. No, that- I, I, yeah, that's very nice of you. But yeah, they, every day, I, I think with a lot of, I feel like a lot of like creatives and uh, musicians, particularly, um, probably musicians and comedians, uh, just don't think they're any good. Have And besides just like, People are full of themselves and are too cocky. But most of the right. times that's hi- hiding insecurity. Anyways, yeah. uh, so from there we started doing like these production albums for position that are like more or less usually instrumental albums. Um, and those can be like epic hip hop. We just wrapped up um, modern hip hop and it's more just like background music for TV shows and for ads. Um, We have like a few different quote unquote bands um, that we write songs with that like, would you like huge epic, like pop anthems for, and we, that band's called mountains first machines. And that's seen a bit of success also like on ESPN where they actually pay us this time. And (laughs) um, league of legends, which is a video game uh, by riot. They, have been nice enough to use our music pretty much every year um, for their big world tournament. Um, And there's just like all these different avenues. Like one of the things we've been trying to do for the past few years is like have more streams of revenue and more income coming in from not just movie trailers, but video game trailers and TV promos and TV spots for movies and like the ESPN stuff, like just going to commercial and sporting events and UFC promos and like tr- basically trying to diversify ourselves and not just be the guys that do dark covers or not just be the guys mm. that do trailer music, but like do as many different genres as we can. And like our whole thing, like when we first started doing this, we were trying to figure out like, what value can we bring to position? Cause like at the time we were trying to get them to sign us to a publishing deal, um, which ultimately thankfully they did. And we were trying to figure out what value do we bring to the company? And I think that's kind of at some point as a creative, you have to sit down with yourself and figure out what value do you bring? How can you, why should someone hire you for a job instead of someone else? And for us, like our thing was we're going to do, any genre you need and we're going to do it really well and we're going to our we will deliver it faster than anyone else so like if if we can just turn it in to you with with by the end of the day like if you th- this is our thinking for a position for example like if mm-hmm. a client comes to them and says hey i need music for an hbo promo um and our deadlines tomorrow uh, can you guys get me something as soon as you can? Like, we'll write a custom piece of music, like 30, 60 seconds for them um, and turn it in by the end of the day if we can. Just, I mean, it, it's getting to be like, people are learning that there's more music in the music department of the film and TV world than there is maybe um, spread out in the music industry. And so it's it it's starting to get a bit more oversaturated as more people start 
working for music library companies. Um, and there's way more competition now than even there was three years ago. So, I mean, you, you have to be, um, you have, you, you have to deliver top content. You have to be the best and you have to be able yeah, to deliver by delivering it quickly. That's your way that you stand out. That's your exactly. competitive edge. And, and not was, just, not just that speed, but like the quality of it, it has to be, you have to be able to deliver a track that is ready to go to air tonight. If, and we, we've had Damn. like there was on America's got talent last season. Some of these deadlines, like you wouldn't believe we'll work on something for six months and then literally there was an episode of America's Got Talent last year. They asked us for stems on something Monday morning for the show that was airing Monday night. And we were just <clears> like, shouldn't this have been in the can like weeks ago? Holy. But, it's really interesting for me to hear these things though, right? Like I love these little details and I don't know, like it's cool to hear. I don't know them. your, yeah, like I don't know this profession on this level. So like that little like under the hood look, I'm like, whoa, cool. <laughs> um. <laughs> But you said something, you were talking about mountains versus machine. I had two questions as you were saying that. Okay. Or two things to say. One question, one thing. I remember when I was at your wedding, um, so a couple years ago now, I was with you and Jose and we were talking about, uh, specifically, I think it was mountains versus machines. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, mountains versus machine. It would be versus. What do you... It's what? However, we always just put VS. So if you say versus... Mountains versus Michigan. I don't My know. My mom always corrects me on that. I'm going to say versus. Yeah. I'm going to leave this in and I'm going to say versus. So if, yeah. if you're listening, mom, look, I learned. Um, you were talking about it. And it was such a fun, simple conversation. And we were talking about the days of like divided by Friday, getting that ESPN placement and how different it was. Yeah. Because it was this whole grind. It was like this if every star aligns, we'll get that track and then they'll yeah. play it and you don't get paid, but it's like, this is your shot. Yeah. And then as soon as you found your better lane, not only did you, you were getting all sorts of stuff placed, you were getting paid for it. It accidentally started streaming well on Spotify as an yeah. afterthought. And it was just this, there was an underlying feeling of keep it simple. Yeah. And I don't mean to say that to discredit hard work that bands put in but it was like i think people can get caught in the wrong process and forget that things should flow and be simple dude absolutely. and you really hit a stride with that yeah i mean our approach has always been like i mean the classic like keep it simple stupid like there's no point for us and and part of it is almost by like necessity of like we don't have time to spend dialing guitar tones on amps and miking up a drum kit and just spending hours working on these tones and tuning the drum. Like, we'll pull up a sample uh, drum kit on contact. We, I mean, at this point, we have, like, templates set up, but we'll use presets. We'll mm -hmm. dial in it. If it sounds good to us, I mean, that's what matters the most to us. And spending all this time trying to just agonize over like well it, we can't quantize this and it's got to be live and just for us that has never seemed like the best use of our time because yeah i mean really now with these deadlines like time is money for us and i can spend four hours making sure just this guitar part's nailed down or i can spend about five minutes editing quantizing doing what i want to it and getting it where it sounds great Maybe yep. it's I mean, it's not perfect, but it, it, it's good enough, and it, it, that that's part of it for us. It, it's like just not yeah. o not overthinking so much of like realize who's going to be listening to your music. Like, are you? I know you want it to sound so good, but like, are these audio engineers who actually like in the point one percent of the world of their ears of people who can actually hear the difference? Are they the ones listening to your music and analyzing your music? Probably not. And especially for us, like a lot of times our music is behind dialogue and behind sound effects and stuff like. Right. The, the, yeah. I, it's, I it's guess may, really maybe the stakes are lower for us in some, even though like it's going to a bigger audience. Like we, by the time I wrap this project, I'm opening a new project and have moved on to the next. I don't have time to like harp on this too much. And, and that's been fortunately, like a benefit for us. It was like, we, we well, don't no, have time to overthink that. it. 
I love that. And I think that it's this, it's hard to explain, right? Because you can't be uh, negligent and, and yeah. like sloppy. Exactly. Exactly. But there is this really interesting balance that I find in a lot of successful people of just this concept of like ship it, like send yeah. it, like do yeah. the thing. So it's that balance of you're good at what you do. You have years of experience behind yeah. it. Like you understand enough music, you've written enough of these songs. And I think that by each one you write, you get better. Yeah. So it's not that you're bad at this. It's not that you're sending sloppy music, but you don't overthink it and you send it, you actually ship it. And then you keep going. Cause I think that the, the amount of songs and music that you have written now yeah. is just like, that's what's giving you that edge. And that's how you can continue to do it. Whereas yeah. somebody who spends a year perfecting one single album, yeah. they're going to end up being behind. Cause if those songs, no matter how well they're mastered and mixed and perfect, if those 12 tracks don't appeal, they're just not going to get the placement. Dude, so by you having a hundred, uh, eight out of 10 tracks instead of 12, 10 out of 10, I think you just win. Yeah. Absolutely. And when you explained that to me, when you guys were explaining that to me, it really blew my mind. Dude, like um, a perfect example of that, like literally, and this is a just quick story. Like please, um, yeah. three weeks ago, a month ago, um, Jose was in LA and I was in North Carolina and we got a very last minute brief and that's, hey, we need a new Mountains First Machine. It was a Monday. They need a new Mountains First Machine song due by Friday. And mm -hmm. Jose was going to be at Disneyland every day that week. So we wrote a song in probably an hour and a half through Google Docs and through voice notes and just like me humming in a melody to him, him saying how he thought that melody could be better and sending it back to me. And then when he got back to his Airbnb, he recorded it. And it was like one of the best songs. It's going to be our next single. Like It was one of the better no songs way. we've done. Yeah, it, it's it's being able to just keep it simple. And like, we, like honestly, we, we learned from that because I think he and I recently have been spending too much time on lyrics. And like, we didn't have time to try and make sure every word was perfect. It was just like, yeah, you, that's a good line. Next. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah that's a good line. Next. And it, yeah. it, it's... Dude, it goes back to what I was saying earlier of like creatives get, are bad about overthinking things. And that leans into what we're saying here. Like, yeah. just, just don't overthink it. I think also, especially given the day and age that we live in, yeah. people consume so yeah. much yeah. media. So it's like these, I think it's unfortunate to a degree, right? But like certain pieces of work are less precious. Yeah. So like to treat it like it's so precious and like you're like you're going to deserve that a much or that you're going to get that much attention in what you yeah. put out. Like it's not real right now. Dude, I, 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 I like I a big learning thing for me, like in the past two years, I really like when I moved to L.A. and we were in these studios, like we were in some big studios and seems like, oh, wait, like you guys have all of the same plugins I have. You're just better at it. Like I I. I've had in my mind that like, oh, they, they're in LA. These top producers must just have like way better sounds and scents and plugins mm -hmm. and presets and all of this. And and they do have a lot of better instruments and um, scents that are thousands of dollars. But like now we live in a time where like that Billie Eilish album was done in a bedroom on in a, yeah. in, in a logic session and like seeing like all these behind like genius does a bunch of stuff on their youtube channel and like all these tracks of like a lot of hip-hop too it's all just guys on their laptops and like they're on the radio and you anybody listening to this you can buy logic for 199 and you have the same tools that all the top people do and like i saw a video of the chain smokers and they were pulling up logic plugins like built-in stock plugins and maybe it was on Logic, maybe it was on Cubase or something. But like they're just the default plugins from their DAW and clicking presets. Like they're recording a male vocal and they would click the male vocal preset. And that's when I was like, you know, like these dudes are like some of the top earners and producers in the world. And they're just using, like there's no reason you need to overthink it. There's no reason yeah. you can't do this yourself. Like even, yeah. if, even with the base knowledge of production and songwriting, like it's the best time to be a songwriter and producer. Like it, it's unbelievable. And it's all on YouTube. That's the bottom I, line. If you take one thing from this podcast, 
anything you want to do is on YouTube. Just type it in. Dude, I, I could, like you said that so well, I could not agree more. And to further back that point, I think that it's like that with a lot of different professions right now. Like you're talking yeah. about like music and production, but even, and I, I don't know if you get this feeling, but like photography or podcasts, Absolutely. like two things that I've kind of gotten into, like with podcasts, I'll listen to a podcast and it'll be like, to me, in my opinion, the cleanest production. It'll yeah. be the, everything sounds so good. And I'll like hit them up and I'll be like, yo, what do you record on? What, like what plugins, yeah. what's your chain? And they're like, oh, it's just this like random road mic that I travel with. And I'm like, yeah. there's no way. So again, it's like they per they've perfected their craft. They're not leaning on their gear or like the amount of videos that you see that are amazing done on iPhone now, Dude. or, you know, you think this creative has the best camera and they must have the best lens. And it's like, no, nah, they just figured out how to edit really good. They had a yeah. vision and they executed it. And they have a good so, story to tell. Yeah, exactly. So I, I love that you said that. Another thing that I think about with you guys, and it's it's probably because I'm literally right now in the middle of rereading this book that I like a lot. I read this concept and it just felt so fitting to like everything that you and Jose are doing with this. Okay. And uh, it's this book, Good to Great by Jim Collins. Book been around for a while. He did like a study on what makes certain companies good and what other company, like why certain companies elevate to great. Okay. He's talking about something called the hedgehog concept. And it was basically simply said, the hedgehog concept is a simple, crystal clear concept that flows from a deep understanding about the intersection of the following three circles. First being, what can you be the best at in the world? Second, what drives your economic engine? And third, what are you deeply passionate about? And mm. when all of those combine, when you just focus on those, you win, right? And he kind of talks about like a fox versus a hedgehog where the fox yeah. like is super nimble and jumping around and doing all these things. And the hedgehog seems like really simple. And it's just like, boop, 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 boop. And if it's ever in danger, it curls up and it has its spikes, but it just stays in its lane. Yeah. And I, I was thinking about that. And I was thinking about when you guys pivoted from DBF into like writing and composing and all of that, you found that thing. Yeah. And you just went like you, I, I don't know. Right. It, it sounds, yeah. Like I mean, that. like when you say that, like it sounds like the perfect storm, like that we experience of like the, our, what were the three things? So the first one, and I'm curious, like I actually wanted to ask you, like I okay. wanted to see from your point of view. So the first one, what can you be the best in the world at? And okay, he actually so, so, goes so, on to say, I don't know, keep going. What keep also, what can you not be the best at? And like being honest about what you're not. Oh, be the okay. Best at. Yeah. That's really interesting. So, like, um, when, yeah, I'm going to take them one at a time. So this first one, like when we started doing it, um, and by, I mean, like start, started having some success with media composing, media composition, um, in our heads, we had always just thought like, oh, we can write any genre. Just tell us what genre you want us to write. And so there was this gap for us that we had to close pretty quickly of like the taste that we have and how to make like how to get it to that quality like we knew what we wanted everything that we wrote to sound like but we had to figure out how to produce it ourselves and so we mm -hmm. had to learn all of that but we knew once we did that that we could produce any genre and it would be like pr pretty decent like and enough that we could trick someone into thinking hey this is a hip-hop song hey mm -hmm. this is a country song hey this is a pop song like we, we felt like we had a good enough understanding of that and so like where we felt like we had a unique in uh, was that through working with Position, like a company that does sync, if they tell us, hey, we need this something that sounds like A, B, or C, we can execute that really well and we can do it really fast. Like I was saying before, our whole thing was we wanted to do top quality, top speed, and beat everyone. We wanted to be the first across the line, mm -hmm. but not just be the first across the line, be the first across the line with just an amazing product to deliver to them. So like for us... That was the thing. What was the question? Like, what, how did well, he so, it? Well, uh, so it sounds like, what can you be the best in the world at? And it sounds yeah. like you were saying, like, learning the production. Once you knew your production, yeah. you and could the, do and, it for and, anything. Yeah, and the writing. Like, we could write and produce top quality stuff at 
the level required of us. I'm not saying we're the best in the world. That's where I'll draw the line. But mm. I knew we could do it really well. But what's According funny to though, Jim Collins, you yeah, need to be the best. I know. Shoot, all right, I take it back. This is awkward. Uh, but what's funny? So then he said, "What also aren't? What what was the like, yeah yes? Yeah. So and also transversely knowing and understanding what you can't be the best in the world. Okay, not trying to do it all. Perfect. Yeah. So what we had to learn though was that we can't. <laughs> write all of the genres and be the best we can't do dubstep for example we can't there, there's all of these other genres that we thought like oh anything like when we first started working with position we were telling them like hey anything you guys need we can we can do it the best and we'll kill it and then th some requests started coming in that were like oh actually we can't we're not any good at that and we had to learn that like there was a uh we were asked to do a piece. I don't remember who it was for. Maybe it was like Tark. I don't know who it was for. It's not important. But it was, can you do like a big orchestral Christmas thing in the style of John Williams? And I was like, dude, I love Home Alone. Absolutely we can. And then mm -hmm. that, that was when I was like, oh, no, he is the best living composer for a reason. And <laughs> me with my absolute zero uh, experience in a classroom but this is five years ago, like I had no idea where to start. And so that, that was a big thing too, of like knowing what you're good at, but also knowing what you're not good at and what you should say, Hey, I'm not the guy for this. Cause that's again, going back to like time spent, it's a waste of time trying to fake something that ultimately you're not any good at. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Love that. All right, so Continuing the on. What was the second? <laughs> Jesus. Um, the next piece is what drives your economic engine? What uh, makes you money? That's like, what, what makes me money or what makes me want to make money? What? No, like what actually makes you money? The single denominator. So it's like profit per X profit per what, what thing do you do equals profit? So we, we take a look at our ASCAP statement, um, probably every quarter. And mm -hmm. we see, all right, here are our top earners. And mm -hmm. that's usually how we decide um, where we're going to turn our attention for the next few months. Right. Well, it's interesting, right? Because again, this is a, it's a funny thing to talk about because earlier as we were talking, you were saying you're kind of trying to diversify now where yeah. you're doing more than just movie trailers. You want to mm -hmm. be able to do syncs, whatever. So I don't think it necessarily means like go bold yeah. on vision only do movie trailers but it's like you found that your production and how fast you can turn things what are the most successful things kind of yeah. thing, right and also so, like part of that too is i mean because there is there there should be some room for experimenting and trying something like we did one album um a production album like three years ago it's called it was second in a series for position that we did not do the first of. It's called Fun Drums 2. And it's like these Brazilian drums and fun kind of like tribal <laughs> stuff. And it just sounds so like funny. And then like it's made like some really substantial, like it was in a thing for Madagascar and like all these random things that we never think about. And part of fun that is Drums 2. Yeah, go. dude. The Squeakquel. And part of that though <laughs> is, is like we have a great company and great people at position that tell us, hey, we need you to work on this. Hey, we've seen success with this. You guys, we think you guys would kill this, do this. Um, but like, so within the realm of don't waste time, also like do allow yourself some ex experimentation. Because uh, like now part of our success and part of like our income comes from having like 600 tracks or something, like just having yeah. that quantity that or really like just the sheer amount of songs we have, like the streaming numbers, they may not all just be slamming on spotify but it's a doing, snowball effect exactly now. there's just so well, many i mean bro like if we rewind it though and look at it on a bigger picture your economic engine is not being in a punk band your economic yeah. engine <laughs> is being producers right as yeah. soon as you were like oh we get checks by getting syncs and having music like this yeah i feel like that's it too right it's like clearly Absolutely. you guys weren't making money when you were in a touring band and you found started making exponential money when you started writing producing, doing syncs, this side of it, right? Well, yeah. Well, another thing that I, I want to say on the, this is Jose and I, pretty early on, we were well, like, once we started seeing some success, we, we had to realize that 
the there is like artistry and a craft to a lot of what we're doing, but a lot of the gigs we're doing, it's a painter being hired to paint someone's house is the best way I've heard it put before. And hmm. I'm not here to do this great Da Vinci painting on your house. I'm here to do what you're asking me to do. Mm-hmm. And there's an objective for it and you're going mm-hmm. to pay me for it. And at the end of the day, Jose and I both have wives. I have a mortgage. We got car payments, got student loan payments. We got to pay <laughs> off. Like we're here to keep that uh, engine of money rolling. And so like part of, there is some like, what I'm trying to get at is like the idea of, and this may just be in my head, but like, I could see a former version of myself being in a punk rock band and seeing it's what Jose and I've done as quote unquote selling out. Mm. And Jose and I think selling out is a really funny term because that means you're making money doing what you love and <laughs> making music. And you could almost she, say that selling out could cause some soul doubt, which was what we still wish you would name the podcast. <laughs> There's a Uh, funny backstory to that that I will make very short. Uh, I did not know what to name the podcast. I was with Matt and Jose about a year ago, and we had a very long, long discussion about calling it sold out, but calling it like all sorts of different versions that aren't just S-O-L-D. Oh, yeah. Like soul doubt, like S-O-U-L, soul, like Korea, soul doubt. Anyways. Um, (laughs) So, but like. Sorry. I'm so sorry. (laughs) (laughs) It's some great quality puns in there that we're just not going to have time for. Uh, it's funny. But like just realizing that we're in a business to make money and we are getting to make a living making music. And like if that is considered selling out, then like sure, you can say we've sold out. I could not care less. At the end of the day, I'm able to pay my mortgage. <laughs> Well, th- yeah, that, but also like, okay, so you've sold out, you you have fun drums too that strangely pay money that maybe young punk version of Matt would not love, but like you also got to go with Air Studios, mm-hmm. what it's called. Like that wouldn't have happened. So along no, no, with I, some of those moments, I, it's like I don't you get have to accomplish any, career highs. I don't have like any sort of self-doubt of yeah, 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 myself yeah. of <laughs> being sold out or whatever. I don't care at all. Okay. Well, that answers that. And then the third one is, what are you deeply passionate about? And I think the reason so, yeah, that that's that, written is like, you can't keep going. You can't stay a hedgehog. You can't stay in your lane see, unless I, you're doing something you're passionate about. I think you and I have talked about this before because you and I, as you know, for the listener, have like a catch-up call every, usually like what, six months or so, yep. where it's just updating each other on our lives and I typically choose Heinz. Get it at, like a ketchup call, like as if we were just talking about our God. favorite kinds of ketchups. I'm I sorry, hate, dude. No, I hate I'm honestly. On I right hate now. that that one flew by me. <laughs> and I, and what I hate more is that you'll be able to hear my <laughs> ignorance listening to this. Of me you're gonna run to it piece back that together. Go, oh, oh, you fool. <laughs> um, but what are we talking about? Oh, yeah, what are your passions? I'm sorry. About? <laughs> yeah, what you're passionate about. We have a catch-up call. It's something yeah, that you yeah. and I talk about And, a like, lot. figuring out where to put your priorities. So, like, when I was... Right when we got into this and when I decided to move back to North Carolina, I wrote down, like, what... I, I wrote down a list. I said, who am I? Who do I want to be? What do I love? And... Whoa. I feel like I've told you this. Are you feigning shock? Uh, no, 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 no. This is crazy. Keep going. Oh, okay. So yeah, I made lists. I, I did pros and cons. Um, and w- like at the top of my list, like obviously Hannah, all oh, love sappy. Uh, <laughs> but professionally, because that's what we're talking about, I had music, I had films, and I think the third one was just question marks. Like that. That was. Those are the two things I love the most and am most passionate about is movies and music. And mm-hmm. I mean, sure, TV shows and video games, I think that kind of all falls under the same umbrella. And yeah. for me, like that's what i uh, talking about, like it being a perfect storm. Like what we were doing was like, it was providing me an income for point two of these three questions uh, that I was 
through doing what I'm most passionate about is that's working with movies and music and TV shows and music and video games and music. And so like, I feel like I lucked out there because what I'm most passionate about is what I get to do for a living. But like the point that I want to make is, you know, the reason I referenced the conversation you and I have had is like, I feel like sometimes you have to take that step back and figure out what am I doing and why am I not happy and what do I want to do and how might that make me happier, but how might it also not make me happier? Cause that could actually tell you that where you are is a good place and figuring out like those professional goals that you want to have of like, this is what I'm, I mean, I, when you read me that, just now of those three steps like that third one is so important of what are you passionate about do you hate your job like maybe you should pursue your passion and and honestly maybe you shouldn't because maybe you're passionate about it maybe you love the idea of it but maybe you're not any good at it um yeah you have to be able to be real with yourself and um i think finding out figuring out what you're passionate about and what drives you um yeah that that that, dude that's so key because i mean i I'm so happy in my life and in my career because on Monday morning, I am literally excited to go to work because I get to work in music for film and TV and video games. And it's like, it's my passion. And it's the only thing I'm good at. It, like the only thing I've ever been good at is writing music and watching movies. And I got so lucky that we get to do it every day. Dude, that just hits so hard and it's so like you that's the dream like that is it right like at the end of the day money doesn't really stack up like you get to the point of being able to survive if you're doing something that you hate that's not it well i mean there's there's different kinds of wealth like money is a value but like is that worth like your happiness because that is a value also like that is a currency as well and i hate like I hate no, saying is. that we're, I, but I hate saying that we're like lucky because like, oh yeah, we're lucky. That's not advice to offer anyone. Like that's, I used to hate, cool. like I've always loved hearing people's come up stories and like, I always hate hearing, yeah, and then I just got lucky one day, but like, unfortunately well, that is part of it. <laughs> we, no, we talk about luck though. And it's like, I think that luck comes from scenarios that you set yourself up for success. It comes from preparation and practice, right? So when this yeah. opportunity presents itself you to you, you gotta be able to, Deliver. You're firing on every cylinder. You're amazing. Yeah. So it's like, luck, I don't know. Because you spent 10 years of your life in a band that ultimately yeah. did not become the thing. It can, set can you, you up believe for this it? chapter. Can you believe yeah. that it didn't? Do <laughs> they it? didn't understand that Divided by Friday, a punk God, band. They still don't get it. God, they're sleeping <sighs> on you. I know, but it's like, yeah, like luck, maybe. But I think that you... You had opportunities that you were always ready for and always prepared for, and you you set that up through. I guess just like years. No, no, no. I I not trying to discount that. Where I I just feel lucky that like I don't know. I feel lucky that I get to do that. I make a living doing what I'm most passionate about in the world, and like that to me feels lucky. But also, I do recognize that it is the result of a lot of planned and not planned circumstances aligning yeah no for sure and i I don't know like that's why i wanted you on the podcast though right like yeah i i'm constantly searching for these answers myself i'm always like even to this day like life got better like life has been crazy yeah but i'm still always questioning things and i'm always like damn is this it and i think a lot of people are and all i ever want to do is tell these stories because i think that hearing these stories and hearing the things you overcome and the things you accomplish and the things of not overthinking production, like all these little things personally help me a ton because I can think of ways to apply them to my life and I would hope yeah. that others can. So, well, let me say one more thing. Like, yeah, please. because I, I, I totally, I could not be more on the same page with you there. Um, again, like I still do the same, like those Hollywood round table discussions, like hearing success stories of people who have, become successful that's like one of my favorite things but yes also like we've had meetings with like different agents and different like representatives for people who are always no but like who have a tendency to compare your story to someone else's and like i think it's really important to remember that like your story hasn't been written yet 
you don't have to, and you aren't going to follow the same exact path someone else has done. Like I've tried that. And in some ways I did like when Jose and I were in an unsigned band, we would look at bands from our area that had gotten signed and we would try and copy them and do that. And like, ultimately, yes, we did get signed, but like our grander, like from a, take a step back, our big picture careers are different. Like Jose and I are two media composers that have gotten to where we are by the weirdest backwards path. And there are hundreds of thousands of other composers with completely different stories. And like, just if there's Mm. like a kid listening or an aspiring writer, producer, mixer, master, whatever, like anything. Yeah. Yeah. Like you are going to determine what your story is. And like, if your story, if your favorite composer went to this school or didn't go to this school, you don't have to do the same thing. Like you, you are going to tell your own story. Like I keep saying that, but just that it was one thing that Jose and I realized it may have just been last year, honestly, like there's, we, we were in a meeting with someone and they were saying, you guys need to move back to LA and you have to go work at remote control, which is Hans Zimmer's big compound because that's where up and coming composers will work as assistants and you work your way up through this whole system. And eventually you're writing additional music for a track or for a show or a movie and then that becomes you finally getting the gig in two decades and you get to write a TV show. And there have been a lot of composers who have done that, have been successful at it, who have done huge, huge things doing that. But that's not our story and that's not the path we want to take. And we have kind of our own different path we want to take. And we might end up doing that. We might not. But we're ultimately, we are going to, and I think it's important for anybody listening to this, like you have to do again, what you're passionate about and what feels right. Like we've only ever had success just by doing like following our taste and doing what we felt like, you know what, this is the best decision for us. And yeah, it might not be what someone else has done before, but like that's part of my story. And that's just Dude. how we're going to end up where we want to get. Dude, I actually really love that because I, I probably fall victim to doing that too much is like obsessing over other people's success stories and yeah. feeling like that is the blueprint. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, find inspiration, take ideas, let that stem ideas. But your story is your story. Yeah. And if you're good, you're going to have your success doing what you're wanting to do. Like that, that will come. Like when we moved to LA, I quickly realized like, oh, and this isn't like a blanket statement, but a lot of people who are at the top are at the top because they're really good. Like the the cream rises, like everyone, not everyone, because there are people who just fit a mold but a lot of successful people are really successful because they're really good at what they do and if you're really good at what you're at what you do you're gonna get there yeah yeah like the product comes first another thing like you were saying that and i was thinking like i had uh paul conroy on the podcast and he came back for the second time and you know he, he just had such great insight the first time and the whole second episode, like we didn't fully know where it was going to go. We were just kind of talking about like, you know, just goals and things like that. And the underlying theme, almost the entire episode was around one thing of listen to yourself. Yeah. And you said that and I was just like, damn, like ultimately, you know, these things and you kind of have that voice, that compass in your head. And I, I think like his whole story was just the importance of that and how how jammed up you can get if you don't listen to yourself. Yeah, and absolutely. I think you and Jose did a great job of not copy paste following a path, but listening to yourselves. Yeah. Thanks, man. Dude. Yeah. And I think that's the perfect spot to leave it. I loved this conversation and Dude. I'm so glad we got to have it. I know, man. It, like I've listened long time listener. First time. <laughs> guest. Uh, so it, it's, it's cool. It's, uh, it's my first podcast appearance actually. I'm no way. Certain. Yeah, dude. So no way. But this one well, in the books. Damn, that's I'm I'm honored. I'm so honored. Uh, I apologize if you hear me gulping or any uh, ums and likes, but yeah, it's just who I am. Staying true to myself, dude. Yo, like you know, like it's just like who I am. No, I think we did pretty good with that, and I think hopefully, fingers crossed. I'm kind of newer to the not doing them in person, but 
it looks like I have a nice little clean audio signal on my side. I, I hope this sounds... I might have peaked a few times when I got excited, but you know, couple, it's part of the journey for the listener. A couple little <laughs> laugh peaks. That's fine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just Not in character. Thank, thank you so much. Dude, thank you so much for having me, man. It's uh, legitimately an honor to be a guest on Where Are All My Friends? And we're going to turn it back to Andrew Cram. <laughs> And that's it for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. If you liked it, shoot Matt Morgan a message. Let him know his handle is at M-A-T-T-M-O-R-G-A-N, I think. No, there's no... Uh, Matt Morgan was taken, unfortunately. What? What yeah, is it? So it's M-A-T-T-M-O-R-G-N. No A. You don't get the A at the end? No, and it's totally falling victim to the trend of not having vowels and band names and product names, unfortunately. It's Matt Trash. Morg. In. I met, but on Instagram, it's something different. I don't know what it is, but sure. Where where can people find you? I don't know. I think it's M A T T M. I think it's Matt M Morgan. Uh, yeah, Matt M Morgan on Instagram. Matt Morgan, no A in Morgan on Twitter. Well, there it is, folks. That's how you get in touch with Matt. And please shoot him a message and let him know if this helped you because that would mean a lot to him for his first podcast that, appearance. That would actually be really cool. No, seriously. Like, I, I love that. If you are listening to this and, and you got something out of it, it's really cool to hear. Like, you don't hear from listeners a lot. Like, a lot Dude, of people will listen. I'll see the numbers. Like and the ratio of people that will interact and say something is small. And that can be discouraging. But on the other side, the people that do reach out, it means the freaking world. So Dude, please absolutely, send us yeah. a message. Absolutely. And if you like that and you super like the podcast, go ahead and leave five stars on Apple Podcasts. And be sure to subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to. I think we did it. I think that's... Yeah, dude, that's really good. All right, I'm going to end it there. <laughs>